For anyone who's checked their portfolio over this past period, you might be wondering why have some stocks been crashing? Why have we seen a correction at the index level? And what does this mean for the markets moving forward? We're on the eve of one of the most important Federal Reserve meetings in recent memory. We've of course seen many different cohorts of the market seeing significant crashes in their share price from peak to trough on their 52 week highs. Today we're going to unpack all of these questions. We'll talk about what the Fed meeting means and the current state of the economy and how this is all positioned and feeding into a correction at the index level and whether there is cause for concern about a bigger crash moving forward or if this is just a natural and healthy retracement and correction after a real period of sustained strength over the past couple of years. If you do enjoy this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on as well. And welcome. It's great to have you join us. I guess before we unpack all of, of the recent news and then at the end really dive into this question surrounding where the markets head, are we to be afraid of a potential crash? It makes sense for us to really paint that backdrop and think about how markets are positioned at the moment. You can see here across the top level, many stocks across cohorts, across indices, across regions are down and down significantly. These numbers here are just year to date. We're of course only at the back end of January, so only one month into the year. But many companies have entered correction territory, if not further. Of course, this has really affected the growth year end of the market. Many of these technology names have been some of the biggest companies that have been exposed to these trends. And I think if we just think about why this has happened, we know that there's the threat and the potential overhang of rising interest rates. Inflation has remained elevated and more persistent than the Federal Reserve and other central banks initially forecast and anticipated. So as a result of that, there's the threat of potential rising of interest rates as they taper down these ultra loose monetary policy settings. As a result of that, of course, we understand the fact that companies with longer duration valuations, when you bring the longer term future cash flows into the present value, of course, with a higher discount rate that will be used as rising interest rates do raise, that's going to affect the present value of these cash flows. So we've seen a valuation compression across sectors of the market, but particularly these technology or growth year names of the market have been the most exposed. So if you see here, 20, 30% for many of these names down just year to date, but if you bring them down from the 52 week high, many of these companies are down 30, 40, 50% and have seen a significant crash in their share price since their peaks, many of which peaked around that November period in 2021. We can see here at the S&P 500 level, the benchmark index, we've actually broken below that 200 day moving average. This is a critical trend line. But what was interesting as well, we did some, see some really fascinating price action over the past week. We did see that significant sell off, 3 4% at the NASDAQ and S&P 500 level, Dow Jones down by a thousand points. For the first time in history, it actually reversed it to finish green, which was a really fascinating session. But investors are currently waiting, they're uncertain, they're on tenterhooks really, awaiting this Federal Reserve meeting up ahead to see where markets head from here. And so with that contextual understanding, where things are positioned, as we know, there's been an ultra loose monetary policy environment, which has of course been supplemented by coordinated fiscal support as well. These settings are slowly being drawn back as we have a robust economic recovery, which has actually been more robust than initially forecast as well. And so of course, investors and analysts are just trying to work out how we navigate this period and whether the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world can stick this soft landing, or if there's gonna be some wobbles and some potential volatility along the way. Of course, for the headline US CPI inflation figure, the most recent print was at 7%. This is definitely well above that 2 to 3% band that they were targeting. There are a range of factors contributing to this, but we're all familiar with the supply chain bottlenecks, as well as raw materials and worker shortages, which have driven inflation as well to the inputs. I think it's also worth noting when thinking about the current backdrop, the corporate conditions and earnings are relatively strong as well, and they're forecast to continue to be sustained moving forward. And so it's a pretty fascinating period, of course, underlying the fact that valuations have been elevated and depending which cohort and sector of the market stretched as well over this past period, particularly out of the March lows in 2020 and 2021. And so we have seen some of the froth being taken out of the market in some of these cohorts and sectors, definitely more of the speculative and risky uh, end of the market in terms of risk assets. So it's going to be fascinating to see where the dust settles after all of this period. And so before casting our eyes onto the Federal Reserve meeting and really this critical inflection point for the market and the economy, we've got to consider a few different facets. Firstly, we know that the Federal Reserve, as well as other central banks around the world, need to be seen to be acting to curtail inflation. 
It is worth noting as well that this inflationary pressure is predominantly on the supply side. Of course, we've got to delineate between these two. Inflationary pressures can be driven by demand and consumer demand. But at the moment, a lot of these pressures are on the supply side. We're seeing these bottlenecks as a result of the virus and the lockdowns. Of course, we've seen these worker shortages, particularly with the Omicron flare up as well, and the raw materials and inputs as well. If you can't get them delivered and there's logistical issues, that's of course going to rise, lead to increasing costs, which we're seeing flow through to earnings during this earnings period period. Of course, we all understand the fact that these ultra loose policies were set for crisis times. They were emergency time policies and they were always going to be wound down. But the Federal Reserve and central banks do not want to inhibit the recovery. The focus, of course, has been about giving the recovery the best legs possible and the best chance possible to have a sustained recovery. They don't want to prop the markets up and the economy up during this period. And then as soon as the supports are taken away, we head back into a recession. That's what they really want to avoid. It is worth noting as well that we are in a highly leveraged economy. The debt levels, of course, have risen. And if we have a look at the visual on the right here, in comparison to the last time we had persistent inflation at these elevated levels, of course, we know in the 70s, during the great inflation period, interest rates have reached above that 15% mark. But if we're thinking about a neutral rate for this period, it's looking closer, depending on the forecast and the analysts, closer to that 2.5% mark. So even though, of course, rates potentially will rise, it's not as if we're going into these elevated rates in comparison to past periods because we've seen a downtrend in rates over the past 20 to 30 years. I think what's important as well and interesting to think about is this Fed put. We've heard about the adage over this past period, don't fight the Fed. Investors have always thought about the optionality and the ability of the Federal Reserve initially starting with a Greenspan put for the Federal Reserve to really support the stock market during periods of risk. And so this Fed put has been something that investors have always had at the back of their mind. But the Fed put over this past period has never been in a period of heightened inflationary environment. And so inflation remains more persistent than initially thought. It's going to be fascinating to see what and how the Federal Reserve is able to maneuver this as they also navigate this heightened volatility and heightened inflation period. And I think also underpinning all of that, we're all familiar with the fact that there is uncertainties, not only at a macroeconomic level, but at a geopolitical level at this current time, we know about the Russia and Ukraine discussion that's continuing to play out and evolve in front of us. And we're in the midst of earnings season two. A lot of evaluations on the market, of course, have been underpinned by potentially forward earnings rates that will continue to be sustained moving forward. With a strong earnings rate, of course, they can be supportive for heightened and elevated valuations. So investors are keenly watching this next earning season to see if potentially forecasts were better than anticipated. If we're weaker than anticipated, then the risks could be to the downside over this upcoming period. Keen to know your thoughts on it all as well. So drop in a comment below what you think about the markets, where the economy is currently positioned and what you think happens moving forward into 2022. And so that brings us to the Federal Reserve meeting. The FOMC, of course, a meeting for the first time in 2022. The back end of 2021, we had a bit of a hawkish pivot from the Fed. Really the first time over the past couple of years since the virus era. And so there's really three different factors that investors are considering at the top of the mind over this period. I think quantitative easing, we know there's been a very supportive bond buying program and asset purchase program over this period. The Fed have forecast and telegraphed that the asset repurchase program is beginning to taper down now. They're tapering down from $120 billion per month, $30 billion per month coming down, which will conclude at March. Of course, once they get this out of the way, then they have the optionality and the ability to then potentially raise interest rates. In terms of the dot plot, there's been indications about potentially three rates in 2022, three rates in the year after that, and then potentially two in the year following from there. The markets are starting to price in potentially the opportunity for a fourth rate hike and even potentially further. There's a lot of thoughts, a lot of speculation and a lot of discussions about what the Federal Reserve will announce at this FOMC meeting. And of course, the magnitude of the actual rate rises, 25 bips or basis points is anticipated. But if we see 50 basis points for a March hike potentially and maybe four, five or six rate rises, that could scare the market. And then, of course, following on from that, we know it's been a very expansive period for balance sheets around the world at a central bank level. And so it looks like in terms of this period in the taper, we're probably going to get quantity of tightening or a balance sheet unwinding happening earlier than the past cycle. But of course, this is yet to be announced and it's another factor that investors and analysts will be watching for. As we've mentioned, the markets have started pricing in a hawkish Fed tilt. The Federal Reserve do want to retain optionality, 
But it is worth noting as well, the Federal Reserve have telegraphed their movements fairly well. Of course, they want to avoid a taper tantrum here. There was inevitably going to be wobbles and volatility that would spring up as a period as we slowly moved out of these periods of time, but they do want to avoid a wholesale taper tantrum. And so they're trying to telegraph and be as communicative and provide as much visibility to markets as they can. And so then with all of that discussion, the question that I'm sure everybody has is what happens from here? I think there are a few different factors that we do need to consider. First and foremost, I know there's a lot of discussion about, is this the start of a market crash? Is this going to be the beginning of the end? Is this really what we'd all feared over this past period? I think the most important factor to discuss is nobody really knows. Of course, at any end of the spectrum, at any end of the discussion, you're going to have ultra bears and ultra bulls, and then most people will find themselves at some space in between those two extremes. I think if we just have a look at the visual here on the right, in terms of crashes, they're the darkened gray areas. We can see here, of course, there have been crashes. They happen every 10 years on average across the lifespan of the market. And we know that corrections are a natural part of the market. Retracements and corrections, which are traditionally defined as a 10% uh, from peak to trough pullback. They happen every two or so years on average. We haven't had one of this level or magnitude really since the March 2020 drops. And so as a result of this, I think this could be perceived as a natural retracement or a natural drawdown, particularly with the backdrop of the elevated valuations that we've past seen. I think it's going to be interesting to watch this inflation level. Evidently, it's not as transitory as Jerome Powell has been forecasting, but there is thoughts, particularly with so much of it being driven on the supply side, as bottlenecks start to ease, will we see inflation come down 2, 3, 4, 5%? And as a result of that, what type of optionality or what type of compelled movements does that mean that the Federal Reserve will potentially have to do? Uncertainties do continue to persist. And of course, on the virus front, on the geopolitical side, nobody knows how that's going to unfold. But all of them could have potential flow on implications for the market, depending what happens as a result of that. Does look like a potentially much needed correction to take the froth out. Of course, but maybe this could be the start of a crash or a bleed out or the start of a more persistent bear market. Nobody really knows, but I do think it's worth keeping a rational head here that corrections of a 10% or even more magnitude are just a natural part of the market. And so if they happen, they happen. We need to get used to this, particularly as a longer term focused investors. Volatility is likely to persist. It isn't surprising to see that we're starting to see volatility as we move out of these emergency time crisis settings and we start to see this taper pick up pace. But it is also worth noting on the other side of the coin that markets can move higher during rate cycle periods. It's not as if higher rates immediately mean that we're in a bear market and that's the end of the bull run. Rates have risen and of course have been hiked in many different cycles previously. And as long as it's handled in the correct way and the velocity and the trajectory is handled correctly, rates can uh, markets can continue to move higher. And I think it's worth noting in terms of a shorter term mindset, the markets are relatively fearful currently. If you have a look at the fear gauge or if you just have a look at a range of different videos and articles and publications, people are worried. Is this the start or the beginning of the end? And we know traditionally that bottoms generally are not happening when everybody's super exuberant and there's a lot of excitement in the market. Traditionally, it's when the sellers have started to reach an exhaustion. And we had a very interesting candle when we were looking at the charts over that past period in terms of the reversal that we did see from that 3 to 4% down to finishing in the green. Of course, I know on the other side of that coin too, we saw a similar movements from the Dow in 2007, 2008, but it is a different time. So we'll have to wait to see what happens now. Nobody knows where we will head, but it is worth noting, I think. Lastly, when we're thinking about the markets and where we're positioned, this is exactly where the trajectory that the Federal Reserve were anticipating. They were telegraphing it well, saying they wanted to wait to move before we saw inflation sustainably above that 2 to 3% band. There was so much discussion about leaving the punch bowl out longer than, of course, it needed to be to give this growth and economic recovery the best chance. They didn't want to take the punch bowl away. They didn't want to move too quickly and inhibit or hamper this recovery. And so, yes, of course, now inflation is heightened. It's high levels and potentially looks more persistent than initially thought. But if we go back just 18 or 24 months, we were in a no or a low growth environment. There was fears about what lockdowns would mean for the economy over the medium term. And now we are seeing growth and probably more growth than was forecast. It's worth casting our mind back and reflecting. This is really the position that the Federal Reserve and many analysts would have enviably looked at if we were thinking about our most aspirational and best case forecast moving forward. Keen to know your thoughts on it all, drop in a comment below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button. Make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll be covering everything that comes out of the Federal Reserve meeting moving forward. For now, stay well and happy investing.